The Word of God is true. Heaven and earth may pass away, but God's Word will stand. All the lies that have been told on you and told on everybody else, lies will go away, but God's Word will stand. And so I thank God for biblical truth, and thank God for you being here today uh, to share with us as we continue in our series, Relationships 101. Everybody say Relationships 101. Can we all admit that the vast majority of believers don't necessarily know how to do relationships well? Now, we know how to do relationships, and we kind of meander through it, but God wants us to do relationships well because he wants to use us to reach people. If you're the type person who is afraid of relationships, if you're the type person who can't handle when someone is not just like you, then we got to continue to let the word work on you because God wants to use you. Yes, you, every last one of you in this place. None of us are exempt. If you are a born again believer, who've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God desires to use you to reach people. And the fact remains, there are going to be some people who you can reach that I won't be able to reach. There are going to be some people who you're going to interact with that I may never ever cross paths with. So God wants to use not only the preacher, but everybody who names his name. Amen. As a witness for him. All of us who are born again believers have called to be, have been called to be ambassadors for Christ, right? That means we represent God here in the earth realm. The earth realm is not our eventual home. As a matter of fact, it's not our home. We're here temporarily. Aren't you glad that, that, that as the old folks say, trouble don't last always? Aren't you glad that we don't have to stay in this sin sick, sin -sick world for eternity? Amen. So I thank God that he's taken us, amen, to a pathway where we can be a part of his plan to advance his kingdom agenda down here on earth. So if you got your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to turn back with me to John, the 13th chapter. John chapter 13. And while we're, we're heading there, you know, we began to uh, talk about this on last week about how Jesus gave a, 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 an illustration, an example for his disciples when he watched their feet. And y'all heard me talking about feet on last week. Maria said I went on, went, went on about feet. It was just a little bit too long. <laughs> but I had a brother this morning, you know, I told y'all I'd never had a pedicure in my life, okay? And some, some brothers, how many of you brothers have had pedicure? Let me see your hands. Oh, y'all raising those hands high. All right? All right, and, and, and my good friend, Pastor Clint Perkins over in, in uh, d Min, uh, Mississippi, sent me a picture of him having a pedicure. He said he'd been having pedicures done for the last seven or eight years. Where if, if you know Clint like I know Clint, if Brother Clint got a pedicure, then I can go get a pedicure. <laughs> As a matter of fact, my good friend, my brother Adrian Lewis, hey man, when I came up here early to check on something at the church, he brought me a gift card. He said, Pastor, go get your feet done. <laughs> <laughs> so, Brother Adrian, I, I will go get my feet done. All right? Now, when we look back at this text in John, the 13th chapter, guys, there's a whole lot of rich biblical principle that is being parlayed out through this example of Jesus sets before us uh, here uh, in this 13th chapter. Let me get that right quick. John chapter 13, and we'll get, go back to verse number one, if you will. We'll start there again. Because I want you to grasp this. If we don't learn how to be relational, then God can't use us to be ambassadors. One of the requirements of an ambassador for these United States of America is that when he goes to a foreign country or he or she goes to a foreign country, they have to interact with the leadership of that country whereby they are residing. Are you with me? You can't have an ambassador who won't talk to nobody. Doesn't make a very effective ambassador. He has to negotiate. He has to talk. He has to represent the interests of the United States in that foreign land. So, guys, we are in a foreign land. We, Earth is not our home if you belong to Jesus. Can I get a witness? Amen. Heaven is our home. And so, as a result, we are here temporarily. And we're going to transition here one way or the other, either through the rapture or through the doorway of death. And the doorway of death, amen, uh, if, if the rapture tarries, all of us will go 
through the doorway of death. I want y'all to actually pray for uh, my good friend, uh, Brother Tim Ross. He, his father transitioned on yesterday to glory. So y'all pray for Tim and Juliet and their family as they uh, wrestle with the death of a loved one. Uh, death is a part of life. And guys, I'm going to tell you, it's, 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 it's critically important that we be prepared for death. And even when we're prepared for it, it still hurts. Are y'all with me? But at the very minimum, each one of us in here should make sure that we know what it means to have a personal relationship with Jesus. Because if my, if my time a clock is punched and yours is punched, we better make sure that we know who Jesus is. Can I get a witness? I am not talking about being a good Baptist. I'm not talking about having good religion. I'm not talking about the fact that you come to church. See, I've, I've, I've come to the realization that there are a lot of people who are in church but really don't know Jesus, don't know what it means to love, don't know what it means to, to have a relational uh, community with those who, who are in a part of the body of Christ. So John 13, chapter. let's get, get into this right quick, okay? We've been talking about relationship one-on-one. We said, number one, we've got to love one another. Agape love has to permeate through us. Agape love is the God kind of love. Love one another. Let's say love, love. My, fellow man. my fellow man. It is through the unity of the believers that the world will have confident assurance that God sent Jesus to die for us on the cross of Calvary. And when they see the, uh, the unity of the believers, they'll know that God loves the world just as much as he loves his son. When they see the love that exudes from heart to heart, and they say from breast to breast. So love one another. We said number, number two, we said we have to accept one another. Everybody say accept. Yeah. That's critically important because in the church, Jesus Christ, he died so that Jew and Gentile could come together into one body. So there's no ethnic division in the body of Christ. I know we got foolishness going on in our churches today, but let me tell you, if you're doing it the way Jesus said do it, then you don't make differences based off of how somebody looks on the outside. Amen. Can I get half of what is up in here? Amen. All right. So now we've been, we're talking about serving one another. The text says before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. Verse number two, can you read with me? It says, it was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Text says Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would what? Return to God. Next verse says what? So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist. Text says, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. Next verse says what? When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Text says, Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I'm doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never ever wash my feet. Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Next verse says, Simon Peter explained, then wash my hands and head as well, Lord, not just my feet. Text says this, Jesus replied, a person who has bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you. Next verse says, for Jesus knew who would what? Betray him. Who would betray him. That is what he meant when he said, not all of you all are clean. So we said not all of you all are clean. That means that not all of y'all are saved. Jesus had 12 original disciples, but one never experienced transformation. The other 11, by all accounts, experienced transformation, but they had issues. Amen. How many of you know when you get saved, everything doesn't change overnight? Amen. It's called being discipled. It's called growing. It's called being developed in your Christian walk. As newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word so that you can grow thereby, is what the Bible says. So milk, amen, the milk of the word is, is compared to a baby who's drinking milk. When a baby comes home from the hospital or even before they leave the hospital, the mother either breastfeeds them or you get some Similac. Is it still Similac? What's the other one? Infamil. Infamil, right? 
Those are the main two that we had. But if you breastfeed, if you breastfeed, it's, 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 you know, you, the mother, isn't it amazing how God created the, the body of a woman to be able to produce uh, at the time that she needs to produce milk for that baby to, to be able to be nourished by? It never ceases to amaze me how intricate the body is. But that's the kind of God we serve, the one who, who has wisdom beyond anything that we can even imagine or think. But, we, but that baby has to have milk in order to grow. And in a similar fashion, as a born-again believer, you need the sincere milk of the word in order to grow in your faith. Any Christian, hear me carefully, if you're sitting here, any Christian who fails to have word time will not grow at the rate that Christ desires you to grow. As a matter of fact, you won't grow spiritually without word. Can I say it again? I don't care how spiritual you think you may be, it takes the word of God to produce spiritual growth in us. It takes the word of God to transform our thinking. Am I right about it? The Bible tells us that, that, that God uh, changes us uh, into a new person by changing the way we think. And the way he changes the way we think is he puts the word of God, when we take the word of God and put it down in our hearts. We are a Bible-believing church. Everybody say Bible-believing. So we're going to let the Bible, amen, direct our principles in what we do as a ministry. It's not our feelings. It's not our cultural upbringing. It's the word of God rightly divided that will direct us in the pathway to be believers who are advancing kingdom agenda. Are y'all with me? That's where we've always been. That's where we always stay. As long as Doyle or Adam singing the pastory. We're not going to go on on what they said on on, on your latest podcast. I want to know what the word of God says. Rightly divided, okay? Are y'all with me today? So we see this example here, and, and we won't go back through, but Jesus did something that a lot of people who, who were at his level wouldn't dream of doing. He stooped down and washed his disciples' feet, because I told you on last week that was customary for uh, uh, whenever a, a host had guests come over, he had his, his servant to stand at the door and wash their feet because they had open-toed sandals and, and had dusty, uh, you know, the dusty roads they walked on. There's no telling what all they picked up on their shoes and on their feet, right? Because you had animals going through there, and, and animals, you know, do what animals do. All right, by the way, if you walk your dog, don't let your dog do what he does in somebody else's yard. That, that wasn't even part of the sermon, but I'm going to just throw it out there for y'all who, who've been trifling like that. I remember when we, this neighborhood we stay, we stay in, and it would happen all the time, and I would get so fiery and mad. I didn't have a dog, but when I'm out there mowing my yard, I'm, <laughs> where did this come from? You sit there watching your dog come into my yard, and you over there just, t- no, get him out. All right? That, that, that's just for somebody who's been guilty. Are y'all with me today? All right, so, so, so they, they, they would have picked up all kinds of things uh, with the sandals. And so Jesus, amen, and it was customary for the host to, 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 to have a servant at the door to wash their feet. All right, so let's get back here. We see Jesus de- demonstrated a pattern for us to be able to do ourselves. We said it was inconvenient for Jesus. It was undignified. It was even in some ways unsanitary. You get ready to eat and now you leave from eating to go wash feet. I mean, but Jesus, amen, was, was showing us the example of a role of a servant that he wants us to be able to follow in our lives. Can I get a witness? So Jesus gives us some challenging instructions. Let's skip down to verse, go back to verse number 12 with him right quick. Verse number 12, glory to God. We're talking about serving one another. Now this is important because as Jesus gives these one another's, remember at this time, State and time, here Jesus hadn't went to the cross of Calvary yet, but he's setting an example for his disciples to carry on once he goes to the cross, dies, buried, resurrected, and sent back up into heaven. He says, I want y'all to follow this example as it relates to how you get along with one another inside the church. You got to love one another, agape love. You got to accept one another, 
regardless of ethnicity, right? Because Jew and Gentile were coming together, and there was friction. There was hatred. There was this downright prejudice in the early church as well as it is in the church today. And God said, that was never my plan. The divine mystery that was hidden in the Old Testament, revealed in the New Testament, has always been that through the blood of Jesus, all mankind would be saved. Jew and Gentile will come together into one body. That's been God's plan all along. The gospel cannot be preached apart from that. It's not a social experiment. Experiment. It is, it is intricately tied to the gospel message. God told Abraham, he says, I'm, through your seed, all nations are going to be blessed. Now watch this. Let's get back here. I, I, my time is moving. So Jesus gives some challenging instructions here. He says, after washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? Jesus was always asking questions. I told you before, whenever Jesus asks a question, Brother Gary, he already knows the answer to the question that he's asking you. He's just trying to reveal to you what's on the inside of you. Because he's Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the omniscient God, God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So Jesus already knew the answer to this question before he ever really asked it. Because think about this for a second. One of the reasons why he did this was because these dudes, I told you on last week, had been arguing right before this about who's going to be the greatest, who's going to get the title when Jesus comes into his kingdom. Because many of them thought when he came to Jerusalem, he was coming, amen, to take over physically on earth at that time. But Jesus came to establish the spiritual kingdom, and he will come back, amen, when the rapture takes place and after the great tribulation period, he will come back to this earth and establish the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year reign of Christ here on earth. But he was not doing it at this time. They were getting themselves ready. Man, let, let me rub up both. You remember the boys, James and John, the, the, uh, the, the, the sons of thunder? Was it their mama that came and and ask for a favorable position. People be trying to jockey for positions and titles. They want to sit on the right hand and left hand position of authority. But I told you, and I've read somebody say something the other day, it's not, leadership is not about titles. It's about those who are caring enough to lead by example. You don't need a title to lead. If you're seeking titles, that's probably something on the inside of you that needs to be checked. Seek God, and God will open up Every avenue for you. Can I get a witness? After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? Do you understand what I was doing? Look at the next verse. Let's read right quick. Because again, remember, they, he chose these guys, but they were not perfect like none of us are. He chose these guys, and they had issues. But let me tell you something. We're going to see this uh, when you continue to read in your Bible in the book of Acts, when they were filled with the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, the, the, the disciples were transformed in, in, in a lot of ways and began to really spread the gospel throughout the world at that time. But it was because the Holy Spirit filled them. Too many of our churches have, have negated the work and the power of the Holy Spirit to still move today. And we think the Holy Spirit is something denominationally connected. No, it's not. It is God, amen, the third person of the Godhead, and God wants to fill us with his Holy Spirit. He wants to control us. Many of us can't love right, we can't accept right, and we can't serve right because we have been filled with the Holy Spirit. And everything is about what we want, what we desire, rather than what God desires. I'm here to tell you, I want to do what God wants me to do. Even when Doyle don't want to do it, I'm going to still do it because God wants me to do it. Serving the Lord, hear me carefully, serving the Lord can be a delight while serving other people can be a challenge. Am I right about it? Serving the Lord, and all of us say, well, if I would ask all y'all in here to raise your hand if you love Jesus, most of y'all would raise your hands, right? If I would ask you, you, you uh, uh, um, how many of y'all are willing to serve the Lord? Most of y'all would raise your hands. 
But what you don't recognize is serving the Lord is intertwined with and cannot be separated from serving your fellow man. You can't serve God, you can't serve Jesus without serving people. Are y'all with me today? And if your idea of church and your idea of, of, of being a child of God is just to come and just serve him on Sunday, and I don't want to fool with people, pastor, 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 you don't understand, pastor. I've been around a long time, Pastor. That's your problem. You've been around a long time, but you're not growing. You've just been around. <laughs> and God is saying, I need every one of my soldiers, every one of my ambassadors to commit to growing in your faith. And you cannot grow in your faith without time and word and prayer. Amen. By the way, how y'all doing on your Daniel fast? <laughs> oh, y'all did know we were doing that, right? I pray that you uh, decided to, to go along with us because there are some demons, the Bible says, it's not going to come out except by what? Fasting and praying. Okay. I want to know how many of y'all on last Sunday night up to midnight was up trying to eat whatever you can eat. Can I get, don't let me raise your hand. All right, you know, vegetables, fruit, nuts, you know, we said you, do, you can do fish, grilled, baked, whatever. See, whenever, whenever a corporate challenge, not challenge, a corporate, uh, 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 I'm not even using the word mandate, but whenever we, we decide to corporately call the fast, we said unless, you know, medically, you, you know, you got some things that you, you must put in your body, it, it's, it's imperative for us to, to, to learn how to sacrifice. See, the problem in America today is nobody wants to sacrifice. Everybody wants it their way. Nobody is willing to give up something for the sake of the gospel. Nobody's willing to, to, to allow God to use you in an area where you're uncomfortable. Here's what I found out. Whenever you're moving in faith, and whenever you're moving to God, oftentimes it'll be uncomfortable to your flesh. But move anyhow. Everybody say, move in hand. Move in hand. So I said, serving the Lord can be a delight while serving each other can be a serious challenge. You know, even when we talk about what God is doing in ministry in this church and the other churches across this land and country, uh, I'm here to tell you uh, it's time for uh, this church and every other church that's open in Jesus Christ's name to be very vibrant, vigilant, and, and, and servant-minded in everything that we do. Uh, the days of just coming and sitting on Sunday, uh, it's, it's, it's not, those days are over. Because God needs the church to be relevant and out in the culture, out in the community, out in the places of employment, in your neighborhoods, amen, representing him. And so we're giving you opportunities to serve. We, we, we have serving opportunities. It, we, we, when we do the what's happening at EPC each week, when serving opportunities come up, we put them out there for you to, to connect. Listen, you don't need somebody to come knock on your door to say, hey, listen, volunteer to go serve. I don't, even, I don't even want to use the word volunteer because if you really want it for Jesus, it ain't volunteer. The word Paul used was, 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 was doulos, I believe it was, and it's, it's, it's called a slave for Christ, a servant. A servant is not one, well, if I just feel like it, I go and volunteer, just be happy that I can't. No! It's a part of who we are to serve him. Paul said that I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life that I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul said, I'm dying to self. Yes. See, the problem with many Christians is we don't want to die to self. We want things the way we want things. Even when it comes to church, in most cases, think about this for a second. It's easy to love, for the most part now, it's easy to love and serve those who are closest to us. Our family, our friends, and those who we have things in common with. That's, that's not as heavy of a lift, unless you've got a crazy family. <laughs> now, I told you, all of us come from families that have some level of dysfunctionality, right? Right? 
come on, can we all, can we all just, just be free and say that, that we all got some family members and some of y'all may be that family member? I don't know. Because I don't know. When you, see, when you're here, you're looking like you love Jesus. You'll even raise your hand. I don't know because I don't live with y'all. Right? Am I right? Now, sometimes I can pick up crazy with the spirit of discernment. And sometimes you'll let it out. But don't get offended. I said every family has some level of dysfunctionality. I said every family. We're not us, you know, we are. We are the Smiths. And the Smiths have been in this town for generations. I don't care. There's some dysfunctionality in the Smith family. And the truth be told, there's some secrets probably in the Smith family that you've been told you better not say nothing about it. Hello? Some level of dysfunctionality. But, but by and large, you know, you know, it's easy to love those who, and serve those who are closest to us, family, friends, and those who have things in common with us. But Christ, hear me carefully, but Christ expects more of us than loving only those who are like us. I got to repeat that again. That bears repeat. I'm going to back up. Here we go again. Christ expects more of us than loving only those who are like us. Now, this is important for us to recognize because, again, in the formation of the early church and from that time forth on, you had different people coming together who hated one another. Jews and Gentiles. But now the gospel requires cooperation. If you're going to follow Jesus, you can't be a racist. If you're going to follow Jesus, you can't be prejudiced. Hello, saints. If you're going to follow Jesus, you got to love more than the people who are in your family. If you're going to follow Jesus, you got to accept and you got to serve those who are not necessarily related to you blood-wise. Can I get a witness? And remember, again, um, admittedly, it's probably easier to attend church with those who may share your own ethnic heritage or your economic status or any number of other uh, similarities you may have. Yet we got to remember, hear me carefully, we have to remember that God doesn't give us a pass in the Bible when it comes to fulfilling his will as individuals or collectively as a church because something may be a little bit difficult. I hate it when I had to work with somebody and they quit when it gets hard. The number of years I was playing football at Benton High School down at Louisiana Tech, listen, when it got hard, that's when true leaders stepped up. Anybody can be on your side when you're winning, all you fair weather fans. Anybody can be with you when you're 14 and 0. But what about when your team starts out 3 and 6? <laughs> what about that? Will you still stick with them? Are you still bought in? Some folks are only with you when you're successful. But see, God calls on us to be with people who may be difficult to be with. He calls upon us to serve those, to love those, to accept those who may be difficult to be around. Amen? He provides us. Hear me carefully. Although it may be difficult, it doesn't negate the fact that we got to love. Dr. King did it so well. His, the, his leadership of the civil rights movement was so on point with the way God would have it to be done. And when others were saying, let's respond with evil for evil. But he said, let's drive out hate with what? Love. Love. Man. See, God loves us and God expects us to exhibit love to those who he created. Can I get a witness? And he provides all we need to accomplish it if we're willing to accept the power of his Holy Spirit to fill us, to control us. In following Jesus, 
We've been called to live in the supernatural. Everybody say supernatural. supernatural. Above and beyond what is otherwise natural, we've been called to live in the supernatural for God's glory and not our own. Everybody say for God's glory, God's glory. and not our own. And while it's true, hear me carefully, while it's true that people most often choose a church to attend based on what they like about it, we should be asking ourselves, is it really about us and what we like? I would submit to you that the will of God should inform your decision, not simply our will. If I did only what I like, then some of the things that we've gotten done around here wouldn't have gotten done. But when God gives me a directive, I got sense enough to know that I'm hearing from God and I'm going to be obedient to what God told me to do. Amen. Are y'all tracking with me today? It's not about my personal preferences. It's about what Jesus told us to do. Amen. And his word is the perfect guide for each and every one of us. Now, let's look at, look at some of the lessons for us as believers right quick. Look down at your outline and we're going to try to see if we can close this part out. So the first thing we said, we got to do what? Love one another. What's the Greek word of love that it's talking about? Agape love, God kind of love. You can't do this in your own strength. Let me tell you, some of y'all have been frustrated because you keep trying to do stuff in your own strength, your own intellect, your own willpower. It will not happen. Until you yield to the infilling and indwelling power of the Holy Spirit and ask him to fill you, you can't accomplish this kind of love. Because agape love extends from God. And ask yourself the question, if I feel this way, why am I feeling this way? Some of y'all better check to see if you're really saved. Because some of y'all got good religion, but no relationship. Good religion doesn't get you to heaven. Relationship does. Come on in a little closer. Can I pastor y'all? Will you let me pastor you? I'm not your friend, I'm your pastor. I can be your friend, but don't, don't, listen, just understand that if I, when I pass you, I got to speak truth to you. Amen. Have I become your enemy because I speak the truth? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Oh, y'all, come on. Relax, 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 relax. I'm here to teach us so we can all grow. All right. All right. Thank you, thank you. All right, so number one, Jesus did this, the example of washing the disciples' feet because he knew where their hearts were. These cats had a long ways to go. And he knew that, that if, if, if they didn't have a right blueprint before them, these guys would go off the rail. Jesus did not call perfect people to follow him as disciples. He didn't call the best of the best, the brightest of the brightest. These dudes hadn't went to some seminary. They hadn't trained on anybody. He just called them fishermen, tax collectors to follow him. But let me tell you something. It doesn't matter what you do. If you're willing to surrender your heart to Jesus, he can use you to transform this world. No matter where you've done, what you've done, where you've been, Jesus can use you to transform this world. So, lesson number one for us to believe: the world defers to the proud, but God honors the humble. That's what Peter says. Say the world defers to the proud, but God honors the humble. Let's go to James chapter four, right quick. And let's look at verses 4 through 6, James chapter 4. These are familiar passages, scripture, but I want you all to hear it again for the very first time. James chapter 4, and look at verses 4 through 6. Jesus stooped down to wash the disciples' feet, a menial task. Their leader, a man, God in human flesh, humbles himself to say, here's what I want you to do likewise to each other. I told you last week, some of y'all got so nervous when y'all thought we were going to wash feet at the end of the service. <laughs> but let me tell you something. The lesson of humility is something that we all must grasp. We all must submit to the power of God. Sometimes we don't know that we're walking in pride, but one of the, the key signs of pride is disobedience. 
disobedience to God's revealed word. When his word comes forth and you say, I just not going to do that. That's not me. Well, it shouldn't be about you because if you let Christ live in you and through you, like Paul did, then you'll be that vessel of honor that God can utilize to advance his kingdom personally. Watch what the text says. Are y'all there? Because the world likes, the world rewards those who are prideful. But God wants you to operate and us to operate with a spirit of humility. Y'all there? Let's read. Let's read. You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Do you think the scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him. And he gives grace generously as the scriptures say, what? God opposes the proud. He gives grace to them. Go to 1 Peter 5, 1 through 7. He does what? He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the um, First Peter. And there are a lot of prideful folk in the church. Whenever you refuse to submit to, to apostolic or biblical authority as uh, laid out in Scripture, that's pride. Let me give you an illustration. You know, and God knows I'm not saying this because I'm the pastor, but pastoral authority in a, in a local church is something that God honors because he says, I'm giving you pastor after my own heart so they can feed you with wisdom and knowledge of my heart. And, and when, whenever your pastoral leadership leads you in the things of God and shows you the things of God in the Bible, and when we go in the opposite direction, that's pride. Because we, we've said, God, no, my will is more important than your will. And I don't need your man to tell me what to do. That's pride. Okay, let's, let's take it to a little bit, uh, a little, 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 uh, a different level. How many of y'all have been serving and working in places of employment and you didn't want to follow what your direct report told you to do? Now, the direct report didn't tell you to do anything that was unethical or illegal, but maybe you thought it should be done a different way. How many of y'all sometimes felt, can I see some hands of y'all who, who felt like, well, they don't know what they're talking about, I need to do it, you really should do it this way? And, some, and maybe you halfway did what they told you to do because you didn't agree what they told you to do? That's pride. Because if you study the scripture, the Bible tells us to, to, to obey those who have the, the authority over us. And authority comes in many different shapes, form, and size. Whether it's political authority, government authority, uh, authority in your place of employment, authority in your house. How many wives want to cut out that scripture that says, wives submit yourself to your own husband as unto the Lord? How many of y'all want to cut that out? Because you don't understand it. Whenever we decide that we're going to go in opposition to what God's word says, that's a spirit of pride. Because what we're saying is, I know better than you, God. I know people. I, God created people. God knows us better than we know ourselves. Sometimes we think we're at a certain place, but we're really not. And you don't know that you're not there until you get tested. How do you know you're going to love with a God they love until you get tested? It's easy to sit and say, well, I love everybody. Until someone difficult comes into your space and now you got to try to love them the way the Bible says love them, you don't really know that you know this stuff and that you bought in until you're tested. You can sing about it. You can even shout about it. You can even teach it. But until you're tested, you don't really know if you really love like Jesus said love. You don't really know if you're really accepting people until you have to accept people. If it's, if it's just you, you, your, your husband, your three kids, and that's all you ever interact with, how do you know you, got, you know how to accept people who are not like you? Until you have to do it. Your faith will be put on trial. And the testing of your faith 
will tell you where you stand. Okay? Is everybody still with me? Now watch this. First Peter 5. Talking about pride. So the world defers to the proud, but God honors the humble. The world tends to honor the powerful, the rich, and the famous. God honors those who walk in humility, the contrite and the brokenhearted. Text says, and now a word to you who are elders in the churches. I too am an elder and a witness to the sufferings of Christ, and I too will share in his glory when he's revealed to the whole world as a fellow elder. I do what? I do what? I appeal to you. Verse number two says what? Care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Watch over it how? The word willingly is what? What type of? It's an adverb. It tells you how to do the verb, right? Come on. The adverb tells you how to do the verb. So what is that willingly describing? How to watch. To watch over willingly. Not how. I can't tell you the number of pastors I've talked to. This, it's been a while because I don't hang out with them. But they complain about y'all. I say y'all. I mean the congregation as a whole. Man, them folk ain't going to do. Just leave. Here's what I've understood. Everybody's not going to, everybody's not going to be obedient. I'm not going to kill myself because you decided you weren't going to do what the word of God says. I mean, I love you, but I can't, I, Jared, I'm not going to have a heart attack because you won't act right. I love Brother Jared. Now, I'm messing with Jared because he can take it. Some of y'all, if I start joking with you, like, you like, <laughs> he can take it. Jared and Beverly, these two folks here, and a lot of y'all do, but they have a servant's heart. Every time I ask him to do something, it's like, what, what you need, Pastor? And he just steps up to the plate and does it. Amen. Amen. And Bev is right there with him Amen. most of the time. <laughs> and if she's not, she's at home praying for him while he's doing. <laughs> Serve one another. But some of y'all, some of y'all won't move. Y'all asked me to pastor you, didn't you? I'm not running a popularity contest. I'm trying to teach here. And what I'm trying to tell you, I'm trying to get you to understand that when, when, whenever you have that mindset, you can be smug and you can be kind of uh, to yourself and, 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 and not, you, you know, you have the mindset. Again, people, we all have periods of time where we may get off track, but don't stay that way. A servant serves. Serve one another. Jesus, when there was no servant in this house, usually the first person who gets to the house will be the one who will wash everybody's feet that came in after them. But these knuckleheads, I'm calling them knuckleheads, these disciples who were with Jesus, they didn't move. But here Jesus gets up from the table. I told you he was laying down, got up from the table, girded himself, and began to wash the disciples' feet. Within to serve, setting the example for them with their prideful self, trying to figure out who's going to be greatest in the kingdom. Jesus wraps himself with a towel and starts serving in a menial role. Don't ever get to the point to where you're too big to go down low Amen. and serve somebody. Y'all with me? Oh, watch it. He says this, care for the flock, which... God has entrusted you. God has entrusted this flock to the leadership of Dollar Adams for 35 years. Y'all with me? Care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Watch over it. How? Willingly, not grudgingly. I, I will tell y'all this. I don't grudgingly pass to this church. I willingly do so. Amen. Hello? Not for what you will get out of it, but because, but because you are eager to serve God. He's talking to church leadership here. Watch this. Don't lord it over the people assigned to your care, but lead them by your own good example. Like I, I was telling you earlier, there are many pastors who complain about the flock, the sheep. Feed the sheep and lead them. Amen. Stop complaining and lead. Those who are going to follow, are going to follow. Those who won't, won't. 
I told y'all before, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. You know what I'm going to say. Grown people will do what grown people want to do. And if they have no heart and mind to serve, you can preach to the cows come home. But until there's a change on the inside, they just do, they just do them. I love you, but I can't let you stop what God is going to do. Have you ever noticed that in the Bible, God always used a remnant anyhow? We keep trying to get the whole crowd. I'm, it's my job to try to get everybody involved, right? Share the load. You don't have to do everything, but do at least one thing. I said you don't have to do everything, but do at least one thing. Inside and outside the church. That's all I ask. That's all I ask. Just one. Just serve somewhere. Go, some of y'all can go and help us as we try to mentor these kids at Plantation. Uh, the alternative school is asked for, for men to come and mentor some of those kids who are in the alternative school. Just, just, just one thing. Go to Common Ground. Go to 318 Church. Help out with faith and fostering, amen? Do, just, just one thing. Everybody say one thing. Don't lord it over the people assigned to your care, but lead them by your own good example. And when the great shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of never-ending glory and honor. In the same way, you who are younger must accept the authority of the elders. And all of you dress yourselves in what? In humility as you relate to one another. So we should, when we're serving, it should be with a spirit of humility and not pride. God does what? Opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now look, look at 6 and 7, and I got to stop here. Look at what it says. Ready to read. So humble yourselves. Now watch this. It says, so humble yourself. It is, quit praying, God, make me humble. No, you humble yourself. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. The way you honor yourself is, is see what God's word says and do it, regardless of how you feel. I, you know, I believe in counseling, but in this age of counseling, all of us are, too many people are being moved solely by their feelings. Now, I'm not saying feelings are not important, and we need to, your feelings are actually act, act as a check to show you where you are emotionally. And where your mind is. But don't let your feelings drive your actions in totality. Let the word of God be the guiding principle. So humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. And at the right time, he will do what? He will do what? Are y'all reading with me? Y'all don't sound like y'all reading with me. And he will do what? He will lift you up in honor when you humble yourself under the mighty power of God. Verse, Yeah. Uh, verse 7, verse 7, watch this. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he does what? He does what? He cares about you. I, I think the KJV says this way, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. What does it mean to cast? Anybody, anybody fish? To throw. Anybody cast a rod and reel? See, some of y'all are saying, Jesus, come take it. This just said, you cast it. You waiting on Jesus to take it, but Jesus says, I'm waiting on you to cast it. So now we're at a standstill because you waiting on him to come take it. And he says, throw it over on me. Some people, I'm, I'm convinced, love misery. Some people, I'm convinced, love to complain. Now I want to ask you a question. Ask those who know you very well. Ask five people. Am I a complainer and whiner? Just, that's your assignment. That's your assignment. I want you to ask five people who will be honest with you, who are around you enough to know, am I a complainer and a whiner? Can I come to this side of it? Ask five people who you know. Am I a complainer or a whiner, or I'm the one who casts it over on the Lord? 
Because you, this, if you're complaining and whining about it, that means you're not casting. Because when you learn how to cast it, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. All right. So I, I, I sense in my spirit we have some complainers and whiners in this church. We have some of y'all who are constantly just whining, 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 them people, those people, y'all. What about you? Sometimes, come on, here's what, I, here's what I would hope, that we would be the tight people, the tight Christians, who when we walk into the room, we change the atmosphere. Amen. The atmosphere is changed for the positive. When EBC members walk in, I don't want to change for the negative. When you walk in with your EBC t-shirt on, <laughs> complaining, whining, be a person who brings the grace of God with you into a place. Allow the Holy Spirit to permeate throughout your body and throughout your mind and throughout your whole being so much so that when you walk into the room, it lights up. Because right. the grace of God is all over you. Yes. Casting all your care on free care. So, so the world defers to the proud, but God honors the humble. He doesn't use superstars. He uses servants. So quit trying to be a superstar in the gospel kingdom. Just serve. We get enamored with big name singers and big name preachers. And the, the celebrity culture has infiltrated the church, y'all. And it's not about that. It's about serving. Everybody say serve. serve. So we've been called to serve one another. So, so, so lesson for us from this text is the world defers to the proud, but God honors the humble. Number two, the world respects status, but God rewards service. Go to Matthew 23. The world respects Status, but God rewards what? Service. Service. The world will see you drive up, huh, in a Mercedes Benz and think you got it going on. But I, as your banker, know <laughs> that you barely got the car and you're struggling to pay for it. You look the part. But your car poor. You look the part, but your house poor. But you feel good though. Drive it all smug. But can't even buy a hamburger. Stop it. Please. Nothing wrong with driving whatever you want to drive. Don't misunderstand me. But don't put yourself in that kind of bind for the sake of people looking at you, thinking that you are here, when really economics, you may be right here. I ain't had a car in about four, three or four years now. That feel good. I said it feel good. I said it feel good. I said that you can drive better too. Marrera's car drives better. Junior's truck drives better. He said, Daddy, what, 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 you know, you know, since I'm working now, what, what do you think about if I, if I, if I get me a car bed? I said, son, that's, that's fine. You, you, know, you, just, you may want to just wait, though. Those things running about $80,000, I think. All right? I said, but you may want to just wait, okay? Just save your money up. Right now, you flying back and forth, and so you don't have a housing cost right now. We'll let you bunk out here for a year or two until you get ready to do what you're going to do. <laughs> but I say, stack your money up, son. Now, I'm not, I'm not opposed to him going and buying that, but, 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 but wisdom would say, hey, just wait a little while. Uh -huh. You haven't been employed a year yet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a problem. See, see some of y'all think God has a problem with you having nice things. He does not. But he has a problem with those nice things having you. So I'm just telling you, it feels good. I said it feels good. I said it feels good. I'm going to say it one more time. I'm like James Brown. I feel it feels good. <laughs> hey. All right. The world respects status, but God rewards service. Matthew 23, y'all there? Watch this. I, I don't know if I have time to go through all this. Matthew 23, come on, let's go. 
Her, her. Y'all, we all heard with me? Y'all, y'all holding me up. Some of y'all holding me up. <laughs> Dars, you pulling on me. I feel you. I feel you. Okay. <laughs> watch this. Watch this. Matthew 23, verse number one. Verse number one. The world respects status, but God rewards service. Jesus calls us to forget status and pursue servanthood. The Pharisees were status conscious. Watch people who are status conscious. Now, again, I am not saying it's wrong to have nice things. I'm not saying it's wrong to try to, 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 to advance your career and to, to rise up. Please don't misunderstand. Don't go away saying that. What I'm saying is, is there's an attitude that has to come along with that. And what happens sometimes, the higher people get economically, the more prideful they get. But see, God wants to use you. God wants to bless you to be a blessing. I tell y'all, God wants us to fund ministry at a, at a level never seen before. And in order for him to do that, he got to bless us. Because yeah. us are the one. The church ain't got no money unless us bring money. Amen. Amen. Hello? Watch this. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples. Ready to read. Watch this. So practice and obey whatever they tell you, but don't follow the example. Watch this, for they don't practice what they... Look at what he says. So practice and obey what they tell you, but don't follow the example. You, you heard this pastor? He was preaching, and he was bringing word, but his lifestyle was right. I can't listen to him. What, is, what did he just say? Practice and obey what they tell you, but don't follow the example. For they don't practice what they teach. I've heard messages from guys who can preach me under the, under the, under, under the couch. They can out-preach me, but their lifestyle is raggedy. So should I never listen to them? That ain't what Jesus said. Now I would advise you to go sit up on the the pastoral shit where the lifestyle is raggedy because it's going to impact the ability of the church to do what God wants done. But Jesus says, so practice and obey what they tell you, but don't follow their example. For they don't practice what they teach. Look at the next verse. They crush people with unbearable religious demands and never lift a finger to ease the burden. Everything they do is for what? Show. Show. On their arms, they wear extra wide prayer boxes with scripture verses inside, and they wear rows with extra long tassels, and they love to sit at the head table at banquets and the seats of honor in the synagogues. They love to receive respectful greetings as they walk into the marketplaces and to be called rabbi. Don't let anyone call you rabbi, for you have only one teacher, and all of you are equal as brothers and sisters. And don't address anyone here on earth as father, for only God in heaven is your father. That's what Jesus said. Oh, Father Smith, Jesus said don't address anybody as father, for only your God in heaven is your father. I know some denominations have father somebody, but Jesus said don't call him father. I ain't make it up. It's in the Word. Don't write me. Write Jesus. <laughs> Didn't he just say it? Did I make that up? Don't come and call Father Adams. No. And don't address anyone here on earth as Father, Father, God, and heaven is your spiritual Father. Let's go. Next verse. And don't let anyone call you teacher, for you have only one teacher, the Messiah. The greatest among you must be a servant. That's what he says. And the next verse, watch this. But those who exalt themselves will be humble, and those who humble themselves will be what? Be exalted. One author says it, said this way, he said, God exalts doctors who don't insist on titles. Brilliant educators who communicate in normal vocabulary, powerful politicians who are sensitive to the common man, attractive people who don't manipulate, great athletes who don't strut, rich people who don't flaunt it, and average people who aren't envious of those who have more. I kind of like that. Don't get mad because somebody's got more than you. Don't be envious. 
More power to you. If God makes you a millionaire, then it's more power to you. Then he's a tither and giver of office. When God makes him a millionaire, he's making a million dollars a year, then that means there are 100,000 that come to the church. I already know it. God knows when he blesses me that I'm a conduit. Because God knows that he funds ministry through those who are part of the body of Christ. I don't apologize for that. Amen? And I, and, but we teach it in balance. Amen. Some pastors are afraid to teach on money. I'm not. Amen. Because I know God uses it to check our hearts. Yeah. Just don't get prideful. Yeah. The world reacts, respects status, but God rewards what? Service. See, the world has a different way of measuring worth, but God's ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts. Nobody assigned Jesus the title of senior VP in charge of foot washing, did they? But he just got down there and watched. He just served. So everybody say serve one another. And lastly, here we go. The world pursues happiness, but God promised blessedness. Back to John 13, verse 17, we close it out. Serve one another. So I want you to go and ponder this. Am I willing to serve? Am I willing to get outside of my comfort zone and do something that I haven't ever done as a Christian? Will I do what my pastor is asking me to do? Or will I just say, that's for everybody else? Everybody can do their part. A lot of y'all in here can mentor some young ladies. You can go to Faith and Foster, and they, 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 we have young adults who, who've, who've aged out of the foster care system, and now they're trying to, the, the, Faith and Foster are, are helping to get them acclimated to adulthood, getting job skills and places of employment and places to stay, to get them a place to stay, and they, they need people to, to walk alongside them. You may not be there every day, but however many times you can go, just go and be a blessing, wherever it may be. You may have a, a place where you've been serving all along, but go and serve somebody. Amen. Outside and serve in the church too. Watch this. Now, what Jesus says, now that you know these things, God will bless you for knowing them, right? He didn't say that. He says, now that you know these things, God will bless you for what? Everybody said, the blessing is in the doing. Say it again. Say, the blessing is in the doing. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father God, we thank you now for this privilege. Thank you for this honor. Thank you for watching over us. God, you promised us blessedness. We know the world tries unsuccessfully to be happy by indulging in selfish pursuits. But Jesus, you said, if you become a servant, you'll be blessed. So Lord, we, we are recalibrating our thinking about ministry right now, even as I speak. God, we're recalibrating how we will we'll approach serving you. Because many of us have thought that we were serving you by coming here on Sundays, but that's just only the beginning of the process. We serve you, God, when we serve our fellow man, when we serve other believers and even those outside of the church. I thank you right now, God, that you are a God who hears and you do answer prayer. I thank you, God, that your word is rich, it's powerful. It has the ability to transform us. The gospel has transformative power. You took a murderer by the name of Saul, changed his name to Paul on the road to Damascus and used him to write the majority of the New Testament. You have the power to transform lives. Just like you did with Saul, you're doing it with mankind here today. And so Lord, I love you and I praise you. And thank you for this awesome privilege. Thank you, God, for loving us. When Lord, if the truth be told, we've been unlovable. We've been selfish. God, we've been 
into our own space and our own thing. And, and many times, God, we hadn't been willing to yield our will to yours. We want to do what we want to do. So Lord, we ask you to forgive us right now in the name of Jesus. And as I continue to pray, if there's anybody in this place today who doesn't know Christ personally, if you're not sure or confident if you were to die today where you would spend eternity, listen, today is the day you can get that confident assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus' mind over oh, a foretaste of glory divine. You can have that. You can be an heir of salvation purchased by God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. That can be your story if you want to be a born again believer. If you're listening via live stream or here in this service, just lift your hands. I'll pray for you right now. Glory to God. Maybe you hear you say, Pastor, you know what? I, I, I believe. I remember the time when I invited Christ into my heart to save me. But Pastor, I'm going to be honest with you. Serving has not been something that I've been just passionate about jumping out into the middle of it and doing it. I'm, I'm a little bit reserved. I, I like my comfort zone, but I need you to pray for me that I will, I will release my will out of the way and allow God's will to come in. I want to pray for you right now. Because this, here's what we can't get around. When Jesus says a thing, and you know what he says as it's rightly divided, then now all of us are responsible for doing the thing that we know. And if we're not doing it, we're in disobedience. So if, if, you, if you want me to pray for you right now and say, uh, Pastor, I just, I just need you to pray that, that I will have the heart of a servant, that I will be more active in serving my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and the community of the Lord. Lift your hands where you are. I want to pray for you right now. Come on. Because God wants, God, I promise you, God wants to use you. I promise you that you hadn't done anything or had no attitude. You've been so bad that God don't want to use you. Yes, he wants to use you. Repent, turn around, and watch him do it. He's just waiting on you. Let's pray. God, I thank you right now for this time. I thank you right now, God, for those with hands raised, God, those who may be listening via live stream that are in their homes raising hands right now. God, you call us to serve one another. You call us to kick pride to the curb and humble ourselves and be willing to do the grunt work, to be willing to do the menial tasks, to do the things that may seem off the radar, the, the to, to, to do the things that don't require us being on stage, but just to serve. We love you, Father, and we thank you right now. Touch our hearts. Fill us right now with your Holy Spirit. Help us to be a person who walks with a spirit of humility at all times, willing to serve, willing to say, I'll go, Father. If you need somebody, I'll go. If you want somebody, I'll do it. But Father, we love you now and we thank you. Thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for transformed minds. And thank you, God, that we will serve one another in accordance to your Holy Scripture. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's children said amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise.